my first question would be what is interpretation for you is there, do you have an uh, uh, some kind of definition yeah i think i do you know i often compare what we do as classical singers to what you see on television when you watch ice skating when you see ice skating and the olympics you know that it's a sport and you get judged for the quadruple toe loop and the double axle and how fast your spins are and how spectacular your landing is and all this the, the really sporty elements of what it is that makes a great ice skater an olympic gold medalist but what actually makes the Olympic gold medalist a gold medalist is that he does all of those things that are important to his routine, some, some would say he does it better than everybody else, but better is a terrible word. Better, faster, lighter, those things don't count. The reason he wins time and time again is because he makes his performance his own. So yes, you have to land the quadruple tolu. But when at the end of his interpretation, because, and that's why some people, you know, don't really think that figure skating is enough of a sport. When at the end of his interpretation, there's an artistic element, his, which is nothing else than his personal or her personal interpretation that shows his ease with what he does and makes the rest of us sit there with our jaws dropping to the floor because he, he or she is so awesome. That is interpretation. And so when tenor at the opera is often known to sing, you know, does he get the high C? That's our quadruple tone. Or how loud can you sing? Or how quietly can you sing or how lyrically can you sing or can you survive an opera from the beginning of the uh, overture all the way to the end you know like a car that has to survive a great 24 hour of Le Mans race you know like a marathon runner mm -hmm. there's so many elements to what it is that we do that at the end of the day it's not about the high C it's not about surviving it is about how during this entire journey we made the music our own and how do you do this how do you get it your own um as you know i was you may not know i was greatly influenced by many conductors that that i grew up with as a musician and one of the most influential conductors of course was nicholas hanukur in my life but also ricardo muti or a man who taught me all the bach passions called helmut rilling and all these three were as different as night and day to each other and one would think that they were completely uh, not com compatible but they, they they were compatible and nicholas hanukur had this great sentence that he said he had several great sentences, but one of the sentences he used to say uh, is that a musician, a musician must den Teufel im Bauch haben. A musician has to have the devil in his soul, in his gut. And what that really means is that you have to hunger for what it is that you like to do, like you hunger for a great meal after working in the fields uh, for a long day. In other words, how do you do? How do you do great art? How do you interpret? You have to. I think. In life, in general, anything that you do well has to look like child's play to others. That you're, it's almost like that lion who is, or that cat that plays with its prey. Mm. It, it's, it, it has to become second nature. And the way you do that is you take something that is holy, you know, like the Bach Passions or the great Mozart operas that, that are holy to us. You know, a little bit like if you were a soccer player and it's the first time you got to play on the field where Manchester United mm -hmm. plays or you got to play in Wembley. You know, that that's what I mean by holy. Places that are awesome and places that are, you know, are the first time a skier goes down in Kitzbühel at the Streif. You know, even if you're never going to be a ski racer, you know that this is holy ground. This mm -hmm. is 
really important place. So for opera singers, that's the Vienna State Opera or the Musikverein or, or you know, Covent Garden or Royal Albert Hall or the Metropolitan Opera, all these places. You go there and you think about all that place, what that place means. But at the end, if you could just express your own interpretation of this, what what makes you tick, what you like. Because one thing you should never do is repeat someone else's greatness. It'll go flat. It'll go... It won't. It won't hit. It won't. Uh, it won't carry because it's not your idea. Mm. So you live in the moment, and what I've learned in music is that you've got to borrow from the jazz musicians, and the jazz musicians in turn borrowed it from the Baroque musicians, and they borrowed it in turn from the medieval musicians. Which is that you need to make music in the moment. You need to let your soul go. And you need to interpret slightly differently than anybody else. You need to make your own interpretation happen. And those are those little undefinable moments, those little almost haughty German say frech, moments where you just do it slightly differently. And if you do it truthfully rather than just for effect, then it just hits the people so deeply. But, but, but what what does it need to be for you personally to be able to be in the moment? I mean, there's as you said with the uh, figure skaters, there's so much preparation, so they are able to do the quadruple tour loop uh, and then be in the moment. There's so much happening before you are able to be in the moment, and how before you're able to look it easy, uh, let it look easy, and all those kind of things. Or the or what you know or, or a totally different question, but it goes in the same direction. Me as an instrumentalist, I, what I would be interested in: How do you prepare, for instance, a lead? For me, you know, us instrumentalists, we say, well, Dave, it's easy for you because you have the text. We haven't got even the text. We have to make up our own ideas and interpretation and stories and feelings and from whatever those little dots on the paper. But you've got it easy. It's probably both. It's more easy and it's much more uh, in, uh, difficult uh, than without the text. But what is your way of dealing with a new piece of music when you get it? To be, to be able to perform as you've just told us. My, my grandfather used to have this great saying in German, you know, uh, 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 auf dem Seil zu gehen, Seil tanzen ist einfach. Man muss es nur können. So to walk on a high line without a net below you. It's very easy. All you need to do is to be able to do it well. Mm -hmm. In other words, everything that you do well in life and everything that is child's play to others or looks like child's play is, is a matter of deep, deep fundamental concentration and before that an unbelievable amount of work to get there. Mm -hmm. um, it, when you see a Formula One car drive around the racetrack, it, it looks like just this power machine that glides and flies to the corners. There's endless hours of work in adjusting the wings and the motor and the, the, the turbo and, and the wind tunnels that they've all worked at before. These are the hours and hours that it takes to get that thing to look like it's just flying around and, and, and it's just this ease of, of power and greatness. Um, it is true that we singers have an incredible gift and that's called the text. So when you learn the great operas of the world or the great song cycles of Schubert, you you generally get to spend some wonderful time with some incredible texts. You get to spend time going very deeply into some of the greatest philosophies of the world, which then the composers used to make their music because they were inspired by this. So this is the fountain of truth, is the text. Everything comes from the text. Music, except for one song in the world, that started with just music and then became a text, is not as good as music that was inspired by words, by drama, by something important. I can tell you which piece that is, and it became one of the most important songs of the world. A very, very famous situation that uh, Paul McCartney sat with John Lennon and Paul McCartney had this tune, and he went, da da da, da 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 da
uh, and they didn't know what to do with this. So the song was almost called Scrambled Eggs because he, he went scrambled eggs. How I like to eat my scrambled eggs. Do I like them with sausage? Do I like the, you know, and he just went on. He couldn't get over da 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 scrambled eggs oh i like to eat scrambled eggs and this this song would have become the most stupid song in the world until by the grace of god uh john Lennon said have you tried yesterday oh, yes yes yesterday all my troubles seem so far away now it looks like they are here to stay oh i believe in yesterday and and it's this moment of incredibleness that everyone can attach their their thoughts to but it is the only example of a song that was created after the text that is a, that that is classic and you know what classical is classical is not museum music or people's music from past days or it's you know, fuddy-duddy old people's music. It is the opposite. Classics are that, are all those things that survive the test of time. Mm -hmm. That is the 1935 Rolex. That is the wonderful Jaguar from 1954. That is Steve McQueen's Mustang. That is Mozart's Nozze di Figaro. It is Ella Fitzgerald. It is not the Spice Girls. It is not going to be most of the stuff you hear on the radio these days, but it is Sting and, you know, it is Louis Armstrong and it is Schubert because, and it is, uh, it is Sam Pollock and it is uh, Van Gogh. It is all those things that we as human beings use to define man's, people's greatness because they are the things that in the end they become so valuable to us like the Sistine Chapel that there is no more monetary value that we can give it you couldn't buy it if you were the richest person on earth and if all the richest people on earth got together they could not buy it because there would not be enough money to buy the Sistine Chapel the Michelangelo paintings it would be impossible they're not they're no longer for sale they're they've reached that place so when you ask me what makes what what makes great interpretation and what do i use i use the words because they're the fountain of all great thought and of all great interpretation mm. so uh, if i want to picture you what do you do how what do you really do preparing so if I learn an opera and somebody says, uh, Michael, can you sing Flying Dutchman for us? I open the score, I look at it, I see, you know, who's, who has sung it before. So I'm a lyric tenor with a Mozart background that can sing anything from early Baroque music all the way to Wagner. That's, so that's, that's the, the, if you compare that with boxing, it's sort of, uh, 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 an upper middle weight yeah even though I look like a heavyweight yeah so uh, you, you and then you see all the great boxers who've, who've done who fought so, so if it was heavyweight you'd see you know how, you know how did how did George Foreman survive it how did uh, how long did Muhammad Ali last and you know uh, all these greats you see and then uh, uh, the same applies in the tenor world you see you know, how, how did Fritz Wunderlich sing this role? Did, did Anton Dermota sing this role? Did Patzak sing this role? Uh, I don't get to compare to, to some of the Italians because it's not that sort of, you know, stuff. Then then I look at it and I think, how? Well, that's possible because, you know, uh, it, it should be logical that I do it. Or, or these guys didn't sing it, but I could because I think I'm different because of these other reasons. Then I look at the score. Then I start singing in the opera, then I start learning the opera, then I look at the text deeply, and as I learn it, I then get together with a coach. And after I've learned the music for myself, I get together with a vocal coach, and that is only a great pianist who's also very experienced in conducting and knows the repertoire, and we work, work, work. And this is like training. This is, uh, this is like me and the shadow boxer in the ring. 
and we do this for many weeks and as I do this I learn it by memory and you know from the moment that I open the score and the the the, the pages are still um, such that you know it's like you have to open the book because it's not been opened before uh, to the moment that I can go on stage and sing it in a rehearsal and be ready and be by memory takes six weeks. Mm. That's for a big opera. It, it Focus can be only fast. on this. I, I, well, I, Basically. You know, uh, it's my job, you know, yeah. but my other job in life is to be a dad and to be uh, Michael and to be a husband and to, uh, to clear the dishwasher and to help around and walk the dog and to answer phone calls and think about my business and think about everybody else's business and book flights and talk to managers about something else. It'd be really nice just to be the tenor, but it doesn't work. In fact, I'd be a really lousy tenor and a lousy artist if I didn't put my interpretation of what life is all about into my interpretation of art, because mm -hmm. art reflects life. It's not an ethereal Olymp only meant for the selected few. My God, how boring that would be. That leads me to another question. Um, I mean, be, being in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place, Liga, whatever it's called in English, uh, where you are, as you said, it's, it's not only sitting at home and waiting to be called, even though you're very well known and even though, um, you know, there's so many people who would never or would love to be where you are and think then well then i could sit in the in the corner and wait until i am called and then earn an amazing lot of money so what for your and uh, i know a little bit about it but what do you do every day dealing with besides focusing on your singing or prepare uh, uh, artistic preparation and besides family business and cleaning the dishwasher and <laughs> being michael <laughs> well to start with, I think, you know, that, that, that famous saying of, you know, you, you've made it. This is, for me, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe you can look back when it's all over and say, maybe I did make it. But I've never met anybody who, who, who has made it, who, who just, you know, it always looks to others like you've made it. You yourself have never made it because, you, uh, okay, so, uh, yes, I have sung for 29 years at the Vienna State Opera. Yes, I've sung at the Metropolitan Opera, yes. Okay, so if life is just a matter of checking those things off, then I've been allowed to check a lot of things off. And I, I suppose, you know, when the playing career is over, you can look back and say, oh, you know, I won so many trophies, how lovely is that? But actually, it, it, you know, life is fluid and there's a fluidity in it. And, and there's two very big truths about anybody who does greatness. You know, one is the fact that, um, he or she never thinks about how great they are. Number two is they don't think about the past achievements, but they only have a will forward. And with that, whatever they achieve, they make it look like child's play. And this is a very big thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason it looks like child's play is because they really love what they do. You know, the, when you when you see Richard Branson, you always have the feeling that the guy's super happy. I mean, I'm sure it's part of his aura, but he always looks like, hey, let's have fun, you know? and. I know a lot of business types, a lot of business types, and I also know the sort. Of, you know, as as a as an opera singer, you you're also an actor, and you know how people are acting. You know, and there's always you know the, you know, the, the toys and the the amount of hours you spend at the golf club, and how many drinks you can hack back before the next meeting, uh, next day, and and how cool you are, and all the you know this is all part of the aura, and the, it's it's all part of a play. You know, it's like a Shakespearean drama. Uh, everybody has a role to play and we we also give interpretations of ourselves but one thing really is true that if if it looks like it's easy to you then it's probably because you really enjoy it um so what what does michael do i mean i the thing about michael is that he's always been particularly as uh, when i look at you know at, at me, Michael Schade, the singer. So Michael Schade, the singer, is is somebody who who knows that there is no um, guarantees in this life. That there is no uh, you've made it there for you get. The word Anspruch in German, uh, which means you know to to have the right to receive something, just doesn't exist in the arts. Uh, there's a bit of a Broadway rule in life in general, which is that you're only as good as your next show. Mm. 
No, you're only as good as your last show and you're only as important as your next show. And, and there's another Broadway saying that shit happens and then you move on, you know? And if something really bad happens, you're supposed to say next. And I think the search for next is what I've always been about. Mm. So I'm keenly interested in what I do. I keenly love what I do. I get to spend moments as an artist with myself doing the most incredible things, looking at some of the things that have withstood time more than anything else in the world. I get to rediscover them. I get to make them sound like they were just written, which is another thing I learned from Nicholas Anacourt. When you interpret something, you, you should, when you take a score out that has all these notes, it's not from 300 years ago. You should make it, you should interpret it as though the ink on the paper was still wet, that Mozart had just written it. That's how fresh it should be. Mm. So um, it's a little bit like, you know, when you read a cookbook and you you, you, have a, you, you, you do a menu of a great chef, it, 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 it needs to be like, you know, has fresh ingredients. It can't be, mm. it's not gonna taste like a schnitzel from 300 years ago. The point is I, I spent a lot of time honing my art, but I spent equally amount of time uh, managing my, my career choices. Uh, managing my ideas and getting other people uh, interested and equally to that those are the sort of two basics i spend a lot of time trying to get the next generation prepared because there's something so important about the classics that you have to teach it to the others mm. you know uh, you have to in order for the business ship to keep running you have to let people know about it but you mean the next generation of of singers, singers of, yeah. yeah. So I, I teach at the university, which is something I've uh, you know I've always uh, I've always worked with uh, with young singers uh, throughout my entire career. So I, I started the the Young Singers Project for the Salzburg Festival. I ran a vocal competition for eleven years called Stella Maris, the Stella Maris International Vocal Competition, um, and. You know, I, I'm also the uh, artistic director of a major Baroque festival, so I like to dabble in management very much. And if there's one thing this Corona crisis has taught me, is that we need to uh, be the entrepreneurs that we've all also meant to be. You know, and singers have always had to, you know, avoid wars and plagues and travel around the globe and and. You know, if, if France was closed because uh, because of the plague, then maybe you had to better go off to England, you know, and, and better learn another language quickly because you just have to survive. And if you're if you were employed at the court of so and so, and the you know your 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 count went off to war, then you had to go with. I mean, there's yeah. we musicians have always had to think on our feet, really. Yeah, I mean, we have to lead our lives in the language. Mm. Tells us anyway. We not only have to manage, but we have to lead it. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. One last question. Uh, I know, um, you know, as a, as a singer, you, it, it's it's uh, before uh, before I said it's easy for you because you've got the the, the text and the language, but now I said it's you've got really uh, a challenge because you not only have the music but you also have the text and sitting in the opera, uh, uh, working in the opera. You always have to act a lot, being an actor. How much uh, being an actor stays in your private life <laughs> when you meet other people? <laughs> oh. oh, that's a good question. Um, well, as I said before, you know, uh, people tend to people tend to play a role in life, and and people tend to. People tend to uh, be certain stereotypes, you know, like the CEO stereotype that I often see is somebody who is extremely thin and extremely fit because he can't let, you know, because he can't let go because you have to be on point. And they get up early and they jog in the morning and they never stay out late at night. Or you get the others who are a bit more what we call Gnus mention, you know, they're sort of they really enjoy life and they're, they're hardy and they're big and they're bigger than life. Those tend to be the, the, the two uh, stereotypical CEO types that I've met. Um, for me, 
I, while I think that uh, that life is a stage and we all play a part, the way Shakespeare has taught us, I. I don't think that actors or singing actors are are fake people. You know, uh, just like every clown is not actually a tragic person. You know, often often they are for some reason. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because by being super happy, you can hide something very 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 sad. Now I I think life is pretty damn simple. You know, uh, keep your shit together. Clear the dishwasher, say hi to your wife, uh, walk the dog. And, uh, you know, even if you get to do something really uh, special, be it being an opera singer or being a Formula One driver or a soccer player or the head of Hoffman or Roche, you're still nothing else but a mortal human being. And our job in life is to uh, get really old and get really happy as old and as happy as is possible, because the, the truth is, you know, you can't take it with you. And what you can do is leave something for others. And what you can do is make other people feel better while they're here. Because not everybody gets to be a Formula One driver. Not everybody gets to have a job that they love. Mm -hmm. And I'm keenly aware of the responsibility of that, of both being very lucky, uh, of having had a lot of luck, of having worked hard to, to do what it is that I do and most importantly to you know to get to spend some time with some of the most incredible art in the world so I want to fascinate other people with it and Michael the opera singer loves to be on stage because it, it, it really is a you know I don't need to bungee jump and I don't need to uh, to uh, to jump off a, I don't need a kick I don't need to drive 300 kilometers and, and barely survive the moment. I don't need to uh, parasail or anything like that. I don't need to deep sea dive. And I have nothing against people that do all that. You know, my, my bungee jumping and deep sea dive and, and crazy time is, is being on stage. And that's a pretty big, huge adventure. But it's really fun to to delve into the psychology of, of how people think and use all of that to become a character. It's really uh, uh, you know, it's a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous voyage, and it's way better than Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Okay. But me, I'm real. Because yeah. it would be sad if I wasn't. Mm. And you know, we all as people, we grow. So I'd like to think that uh, I've grown with all that. And um, yeah. If, if my kids at the end of the day can still talk to me and uh, my friends still like me, then you've done something tremendous in life, I think. True. Thank you.